Tissue engineering, what is it? It's an emerging field, interdisciplinary field that combines engineering and life sciences to create functional biological structures that can restore and improve tissue function. Examples include bladders, trachea blood vessels and if you look at it printing as a technology has also gone through the revolution and well it's been around for hundreds of years. In the last couple of decades, it's been a new dimension. We can now print layer by layer in materials ranging from plastic to metal, to concrete, to chocolate, from the smallest scales to the largest. If you take 3D printing and we combine it with biology, we have bioprinting where the building blocks our cell aggregates where we call bio-ling particles that are composed of thousands of cells that can fuse together into different shapes. These geometries can include multi-layered sheets, such as skin, branching tubes for vasculature and the sophistication of this manufacturing technology improves daily to include different cell types and different shapes. And now why is it important? The pharmaceutical industry at the moment is in a moment of crisis. It spends more money each year on R&D, but has fewer drugs to show for it. It takes more than a decade, more than a billion of dollars to develop a new drug and the cost of a failure can be measured in hundreds of millions of dollars. I wrote a letter last week talking about the work of the foundation, sharing some of the problems. And Warren Buffett had recommended I do that being honest about what was going well, what wasn't, and making it kind of an annual thing. A goal I had there was to draw more people into work on those problems, because I think there are some very important problems that don't get worked on naturally. That is, the market does not drive the scientists, the communicators, the thinkers, the governments to do the right things. And only by paying attention to these things and having brilliant people who care and draw other people in can we make as much progress as we need to. So this morning I'm going to share two of these problems and talk about where they stand. But before I dive into those I want to admit that I am an optimist. But if you were to go to a library at the end of the 1300s, or through the 1400s, you would probably find a book that was then, way more popular than those titles we still read, a book that purported to be a description of the world, a guide the traveling and distant lands of BC area and almanac of everything that was just off the horizon. I am not talking about Marco Polo. No, I'm talking about something far, far weirder and far, far less tethered to reality, a volume of medieval fantasy masquerading as a field guide called The Travels of Sir John Mandeville, supposedly the titular knight set out from England in the 1330s and embarked on a journey that would take him to the Middle East, Africa and Asia, though as it will become apparent, not a Middle East, not in Africa and not an Asia that we would recognize here in reality.
Most of the time when I embark on such an investigation, it quickly becomes clear that matters are much more complicated and ambiguous several shades grayer than I thought going in. Not this time. The deeper I delved into the confused and confusing thicket of nutritional science, sorting through the long-running fats versus carb wars, the fiber skirmishes and the raging dietary supplement debates, the simpler the picture gradually became. I learned that in fact, science knows a lot less about nutrition than you would expect, that in fact, nutrition science is, to put it charitably, a very young science. If still trying to figure out exactly what happens in your body when you sip a soda, or what is going on deep in the soul of a carrot to make it so good for you, or why in the world you have so many neurons, brain cells. In your stomach, of all places. It's a fascinating subject, and someday the field may produce definitive answers to the nutritional questions that concern us, but, as nutritionists themselves will tell you, they're not there yet. Not even close. Nutrition science, which after all only got started less than 200 years ago, is today approximately where surgery was in the year 1650 very promising, and very interesting to watch, but are you ready to let them operate on you? I think I'll wait a while. With a good system of crop rotation, and especially with the addition of any sort of fertilizer you may be able to come up with, it's possible to grow crops on a plot of land for upwards of 2-3 years at a time with good results. Ultimately, though, you must let the land rest if you hope to continue farming there in the long run. Allowing a plot of land to rest for a period of time is known as letting the field go fallow, and there are several reasons for this. Allowing a field or plot to lie fallow means that you don't grow anything new on it, don't harvest anything and don't graze any animals on the land for at least a year. Sometimes a field will lay fallow for two, three or even four years, but the traditional standard on many farms was to let a field lie fallow once every two, three years. This fallow period allows the land to replenish many of its nutrients. The root networks of various grasses or ground covers, like clover, have a chance to expand and grow, which further strengthens the soil and protects it from erosion. During the fallow period, there are many beneficial flora and microfauna, including cyanobacteria, which live in the soil. These microorganisms continue to be active at the root level, steadily improving the quality of the soil so that when you come back in a year or two, you can begin planting food or cash crops anew. According to Dr. Ron Fessenden, MD, MPH, the average American consumes more than 150 pounds of refined sugar, plus an additional 62 pounds of high fructose corn syrup every year. In comparison, we consume only around 1.3 pounds of honey per year on average in the US. According to new research, if you can switch out your intake of refined sugar and use pure raw honey instead, the health benefits can be enormous. What is raw honey? It's a pure, 
unfiltered and unpasteurized sweetener made by bees from the nectar of flowers. Most of the honey consumed today is processed honey that's been heated and filtered since it was gathered from the hive. Unlike processed honey, raw honey does not get robbed of its incredible nutritional value and health powers. It can help with everything from low energy to sleep problems to seasonal allergies. Switching to raw honey may even help weight loss efforts when compared to diets containing sugar or high fructose corn syrup. The area that is now South Africa has been inhabited by humans for millennia. The San, the original inhabitants of this land, were migratory people who lived in small groups of about 15 to 20 people. They survived by fishing and hunting and by gathering roots and other wild foods. They did not build permanent dwellings but used rock shelters as temporary dwellings. Around 2000 years ago Khoikhoi pastoralists migrated to the coast. In the eastern part of present-day South Africa, iron working societies date from about 300 AD. The Botswana and Nguni peoples arrived in this region around 1, 200 AD. They lived by agriculture and stock farming, mined gold, copper and tin and hunted for ivory and built stone-walled towns. Over the centuries, these societies had diverse contacts with the Khoisan. Strife between the San and the Khoikhoi developed over competition for game, eventually the Khoikhoi became dominant. These peoples lived in the western part of present-day South Africa and are known collectively as the Khoisan. Ecology is the study of interactions of organisms among themselves and with their environment. It seeks to understand patterns in nature, e.g., the spatial and temporal distribution of organisms and the processes governing those patterns. Climatology is the study of the physical state of the atmosphere, its instantaneous state or weather, its seasonal to interannual variability, its long-term average condition or climate, and how climate changes over time. These two fields of scientific study are distinctly different. Ecology is a discipline within the biological sciences and has as its core the principle of natural selection. Climatology is a discipline within the geophysical sciences based on applied physics and fluid dynamics. Both, however, share a common history. The origin of these sciences is attributed to Aristotle and theorists and their books Meteorological and Inquiry into Plants, respectively, but their modern beginnings trace back to natural history and plant geography. 17th, 18th, and 19th century naturalists and geographers saw changes in vegetation as they explored new regions and laid the foundation for the development of ecology and climatology as they sought explanations for these geographic patterns.
It might seem a little eccentric, but reviewing your work by reading it aloud can help to identify the wooliest areas. This works best if you perform your reading in a theatrical way, pausing at the commas and ends of sentences. If you run out of breath during a sentence, it is probably too long. You ought to be able to convert your writing into a speech in this way if it sounds too stilted and convoluted, perhaps you could rework these parts until they sound fluid. It is unlikely that your reader will be fooled by the idea that long words make you sound clever. Cluttering a sentence with too many complicated words can prevent its meaning from being understood at all. A short word is always preferable to a long one. Why should anyone choose the word erroneous over the word wrong in an essay? Usually, writers who employ more obscure words are trying to sound impressive but can appear pretentious. Direct words enable you to control what you are saying, and are not necessarily babyish, but the most appropriate ones for the job. When you read your writing aloud, you will notice that the key stress comes at the end of your sentence. It is, therefore, most effective to end with a short and emphatic word to secure your point. Try to resist the impulse to waffle at the end of your sentence by trailing off into qualifying clauses. In a study in the current issue of the journal PLOS ONE, a team of scientists in Germany showed experts and novices simple geometric objects and simple chess positions and asked the subjects to identify them. Reaction times were measured and brain activity was monitored using functional MRI scans. On the identification of the geometric objects, the subjects performed the same, showing that the chess experts had no special visualization skills. When the subjects were shown the chess positions, the experts identified them faster. Focusing on an element of an earlier study on pattern and object recognition by chess experts, the researchers had expected to see parts of the left hemispheres of the experts' brains, which are involved in object recognition, react more quickly than those of the novices when they performed the chess tasks. But the reaction times were the same. What set the experts apart was that parts of their right brain hemispheres, which are more involved in pattern recognition, also lit up with activity. The experts were processing the information in two places at once. The researchers also found that when the subjects were shown the chess diagrams, the novices looked directly at the pieces to recognize them, while the experts looked on the middle of the boards and took everything in with the peripheral vision. One of Guinness World Records' more unusual awards was presented at the National Maritime Museum yesterday. After a 100-day trial, the timepiece known as Clock B, which had been sealed in a clear plastic box to prevent tampering, was officially declared, by Guinness, to be the world's most accurate mechanical clock with a pendulum swinging in free air. It was an intriguing enough award. 
But what is really astonishing is that the clock was designed more than 250 years ago by a man who was derided at the time for Lian incoherence and absurdity that was little short of the symptoms of insanity, and whose plans for the clock lay ignored for two centuries. The derision was poured on John Harrison, the British clockmaker whose marine chronometers had revolutionized seafaring in the 18th century and who was the subject of longitude by Diva Sobel. His subsequent claim, that he would go on to make a pendulum timepiece that was accurate to within a second over a 100-day period, triggered widespread ridicule. The task was simply impossible, it was declared. But now the last laugh lies with Harrison. At a conference, Harrison decoded, towards a perfect pendulum clock, held at Greenwich yesterday, observatory scientists revealed that a clock that had been built to the clockmaker's exact specifications had run for 100 days during official tests and had lost only five-eighths of a second in that period. One of the most amazing things that have happened even in my lifetime is the prediction of cosmology. When I started out 40 odd years ago, we thought we knew that the universe began a big bang, some people doubted even then. We thought the universe was about 10 or 20 billion years old. But now for really very sound scientific reasons, we can say that the universe did start in a big bang and it's 13.8 billion years old. So it's not 14, it's not 13 because a decimal point in there and that's a stunning achievement to know that. And we also know that the laws of physics that apply to tiny particles inside atoms also explains what happened in the Big Bang, you can't have one without the other. A very neat example of this is that when you apply nuclear physics, that kind of physics to understand how stars work, you find out that the oldest star in the universe is about 13 billion years old. It's important to realize that the brain doesn't see the world around it simply as though the scene was projected onto a cinema screen on the inside of your skull. Before a scene can be observed, in your head, it has to be broken down into a number of different components for processing, and these components then have to be recombined into the meaningful form that we call an image. Amongst other things, the scene is broken down into its different colors, red, green and blue, in a way that's analogous to the manner in which a television image or magazine photograph is broken down into tiny dots of primary colors, which are too small to be noticed individually when we look at them, but which when seen collectively give the impression of a continuous full color image. However, unlike in magazine images, the image that we see with our eyes is broken down not only into separate color components but into other components too. It is, rather incredibly, deconstructed into component parts such as horizontal lines, vertical lines, circles and so on. Each of these component parts is sent to a separate area of the brain for processing, with the different components of the scene only merging again when they are unified into what you perceive as the image.
A farming technique practiced for centuries by villages in West Africa, which converts nutrients-poor rainforest soil into fertile farmland, could be the answer to mitigating climate change and revolutionizing farming across Africa. A global study by researchers has for the first time identified and analyzed rich fertile soils found in Liberia and Ghana. They discovered that the ancient West African method of adding charcoal and kitchen waste to highly weathered, nutrient-poor tropical soils can transform the land into enduringly fertile, carbon-rich black soils which the researchers dub African Dark Earths. Similar soils created by Amazonian people in pre-Columbian eras have recently been discovered in South America, but the techniques people used to create these soils are unknown. Moreover, the activities which led to the creation of these anthropogenic soils were largely disrupted after the European conquest. Encouragingly researchers in the West Africa study were able to live within communities as they created their fertile soils. This enabled them to learn the techniques used by the women from the indigenous communities who disposed of ash, bones and other organic waste to create the African dark earths. I think there is an intense competition at the moment to hire the most talented and most intellectually able people. There is a time when I think companies have many of the adventures in the world. That involves the company's world. It was the boss's world. Now I think it reverses the case. We have a shortage in talent base within countries and between countries, have an intense battle between companies to hire the most talented workers and also between countries, which are looking to recruit talented young people, talented young immigrants. We have this sense of immigrants being things that countries are battled to keep out, and immigrants want to get in, climb of the walls. I think the opposite isn't that the case. And the topic is that countries are trying to lure bright young people to get them to go to universities and get them to become immigrants. So, on many levels, talent is a premium. There is a shortage of talent, and so countries, companies, all sorts of organizations, of course, volunteer organizations as well as, are competing to hire the best and the brightest. You know we have a baby boom population which is aging. We have an economy which is becoming more sophisticated. And so, for all those sorts of reasons, talent is a premium.